Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Explain This. I'm with the star of the show, Robin Riddle. Robin, we're in for a doozy today. We are. Like, I, I have a feeling this is going to help a ton of people. Yeah. And I really know, because we've put out some content around functional fertility. Yes. Why don't you kind of walk us through what we're talking about today in, in those lines? Yeah, so today I want to do a deeper dive into birth control. Mm. Um, when we were talking about it in functional fertility, I've touched on it a little bit, more just talking about oral contraceptives and the, you know, the things that can happen when you come off of them and you're trying to get pregnant. Okay. So now I want to do more of a deep dive into birth control in general, <clears throat> different types of birth control, and then knowing our risks going into these. There, it's such a big decision, and yeah. I feel like, you know, every couple woman like lots of people yeah. go through it yeah it's it's going to impact every woman at some point in their life you're going to have to decide how you prevent a pregnancy when you're not wanting to get pregnant so why don't we start with like what is birth control like, okay what are the things <laughs> so when we talk about birth control basically i'm referring to any method that can be used to prevent a pregnancy mm. uh, many times uh, birth controls are also being used to control menstruation or to control you know pms symptoms things like that so we're, we're using it not only to prevent pregnancy but we're using it con to control symptoms a lot Okay, so some, it's not only to prevent pregnancy. There's yeah. other reasons for it. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. So, you know, there will be 15-year-olds that go into the OBGYN or they'll go into their regular doctor and get started on birth control for acne or things like that. And, and I'm assuming you're not for that. I'm not, and we're gonna get it, we're gonna get into why. <laughs> okay, we're gonna get into why. Okay. Um, it, so I just want more education out there because, like I said, this is something that's gonna impact every single woman at some point in her life. You have to choose what you're going to do, and there's not enough education surrounding this. Let's let's educate. Let's so go. there's lots of different options for birth control methods. Uh, oral contraceptives are probably the most common. There's combined oral contraceptives, which is estrogen and progestin. And then there's progestin only. Now for these oral contraceptives, this is using a synthetic version of these hormones. So yep. you notice I said progestin, not progesterone. So it's using a synthetic estrogen and a synthetic form of a progesterone called progestin to control menstruation, control cycles, control ovulation. And is this the thing that you see when you have like that little dial yeah. and it's like you have the fake pills and the real yes. ones? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's Things what we're talking like about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then we have LARC, long acting, long acting reversible contraceptives. Okay. This is going to be things like IUDs or the Implanon, which is a progesterone releasing implant in the arm. Okay. Uh, and then you have things like your barrier methods, like condoms and diaphragms. You have injectables, which is not as popular anymore, but Depo, Depo Provera is an injectable version of a progestin. Uh, and then, like I said, progesterone, progestin or progesterone only pills. So there's a lot of options. Um, and I want to get into what some of those options are going to do for us. Let's let's talk okay. about some of the consequences. Let's, is let's it consequences dive in. or just what's what's it's, it doing? Just the things. All okay. The, all the things. All of them. them. Let's do it. Um, so from the CDC in 2015 to 2017, approximately 65 percent of women aged 15 to 49 were on some sort of contraceptive. Jeez. Okay. So this, if you look at it in numbers, uh, this was 46.9 million of the 72.2 million women in that age range were on some sort of contraceptive device. And what age range was that again? 15 to 49. Oh, okay. So everybody, it's affecting yeah. everybody at some point. Yeah. Um, and so again, one of my big issues with this is what kind of education do we get? Yep. And I've been on both sides of it. I've been the 15 year old that was like, hey, I'm not sexually active, but I have acne. What can I do about it? First option was go on a birth control pill. It's going to control it. Really? The education surrounding that, nada. No risks were discussed. No side effects were discussed. Absolutely nothing was discussed. You know, I had no idea that it was used for acne. Mm -hmm. That's All super interesting. I've heard of like Accutane and stuff yeah. like that as when we're teenagers. Yeah. But uh, for women, uh, birth control, starting it for that's mm -hmm. wild. Specifically for that. That was the only reason. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And then I've been on the flip side of that. I've been the provider in school who was, you know, I did my training in uh, my women's health training. I was in the health department. We were handing out birth control like candy. Mm -hmm. And I was never taught any of this that I'm going to teach you guys today. Yeah. So I wasn't teaching my patients this. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're just told like, talk about, you know, failure rates and how to use things and let the patient pick whatever they want to be on. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like, you know, the people who are dispensing uh, this providers like are 
looking out for the people and, and we families, need to be. <laughs> you know, it's just the education part. Yeah. You we, know? People need to know what they're getting into. Yeah. Um, and so actually, as I started researching this more, some of these statistics even surprised me. Okay. I was a little floored. Um, so let's get into it. <laughs> Number one thing that needs to be addressed when we're talking about multiple forms of birth control that's not addressed is our cancer risks. Okay. Some doctors will tell you there's a slight increased risk of certain types of cancer. And then some doctors will never tell you that at all. I definitely was never told that yeah. as a patient. Uh, so statistically, uh, there's some crazy stuff here. So oral contraceptives specifically, so I'm talking about combined contraceptives, so the estrogen, progestin, they are labeled as a level one carcinogen. And what is that? This means there is enough evidence to conclude that it can cause cancer in humans. Oh, wow. If you're handing somebody a pill and you're like, I absolutely know that this can cause cancer. You tell them that, they, they may decide not to take that. It's like handing somebody a cigarette. Exactly. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> at least most people know that about cigarettes <laughs> yeah. at this point. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, but oral contraceptives are a level one carcinogen. They are known to cause cancer. Okay. okay. You said most, so not all. Your combined oral contraceptives and your progestin only contraceptives, both. Okay. And we'll get into some t statistics on it. Okay. So there are conflicting information between certain studies. Um, like I said, some of them will say a slight risk, but they won't actually give you the percentages. I'm going to go through a couple of studies that actually give you the percentages. So in a, a study just recently released, March of 2023, uh, published by the PLOS Medicine, it was researchers from Oxford that okay. released this study. In the data, there was a significant increase in the risk for breast cancer associated with hormonal contraceptive use, regardless of whether the contraceptive last prescribed was a combined oral preparation. So with that one, they cited a 23% increased risk for breast cancer. Progestin-only progestin contraceptive, which was a 26% increase, and injected progestin like the Depo, 25% increase in their studies, or a progestin-releasing IUD, which carried a 32% increased risk for breast cancer. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that would scare anybody off of it, I would think. A absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and trust me, people don't know this. Yeah. Um, and so they went on, and the increased risk for breast cancer did decline depending on when the patient last used it. So they had patients that had been on them, took patients off of them. So within, if patients had used any of those contraceptives within the previous year, they still had a 33% chance, like average overall increased risk. By one to four years, that came down to 17%. By five plus years, that came down to 15%. Post getting off Post of it? Post getting off of it. Okay. So once the patient decided to stop that contraceptive, their, their, it, that increased risk slowly declined over the years. Okay. So okay. if somebody had used it 15 years ago, their increase in risk has declined dramatically by that point. Uh, I know this is a random question. Okay. How long do people normally stay on birth control? Do you have like, I, it could be a long time. I'm Absolutely. Okay. Mo uh, most women, it's going to be the majority of their life from the time that they become sexually active until the time they go through menopause. Most women are either actively trying to get pregnant or they're on some sort of birth control. Yeah, it's super interesting that it's either one or the other. Mm -hmm. You're either trying to get pregnant or you're trying to not get pregnant. Yeah. Which is like means that you're only off of it for a certain period of time. Yeah, I mean, even women postpartum, six weeks postpartum, you go for your first visit, what birth control do you want? Yeah, and, and it, the make, question. it makes sense too. <laughs> well, but, you don't wanna get pregnant right. again right away, Right. but also women need to know the risks of what you're putting them back on. Right, Yeah. and, and then that starts that timeline again for Absolutely. where you're at risk. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. Um, so for progestin-only contraceptives, uh, again, just some other statistics, the increased risk of breast cancer for oral progestin-only, which is the mini pill, 29% increased risk. Okay. Injected, which is Depo, 18%. Implanted, 28%. IUD, 21%. Mm. This is just over a couple of different studies. So you can see the average of when you look at these is 20 to 30% increased risk for breast cancer when we're using any sort of contraceptive device that they've studied. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So now, to top all of that off, there is a new um, progestin-only birth control that's coming on the market that's going to be over-the-counter. People can just go pick it up in the store. And progestin is the one we, we hate. For both of them, both really, of them. the combined okay. and the progestin. But according to these studies, an oral progesterone, your 25 to 30% increased risk for breast cancer. So if that's something that's been put over the counter on the shelves that any person can walk in and buy, there's nobody educating them. 
Nobody reads package inserts. If this was in the package inserts, nobody's going to read them. No, no, so no, no. So you have this new pill that anyone can go in and get, and they're not getting appropriate information at all. I'm going to put a, a pause on this real quick okay. because, guys, share this with somebody. Uh, I want to make sure whoever's watching this now shares it with someone they love. Uh, anyone you love, share this video. We're going to keep going. But this is stuff that's not out there, not it's talked not. about enough. And, you know, what you just said is a little scary. Yeah. Now, you know, <laughs> it, anybody can get it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's keep going. Absolutely. Um, so the, and then in conclusion from them, the relative risk of being diagnosed with breast cancer, like I said, was 20 to 30% higher among women who have used or are recently using birth control, either the progestin only, the combined, IUD, any of those. 20 to 30% increased risk for breast cancer versus women who had not used any sort of hormonal birth control. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's just interesting how, like, you know, uh, I'm 37, and it, I don't know anyone who uh, you know, hasn't, like, just done it. Yeah. You know, it's super it's weird. super mainstream. You Maybe go to the doctor, here's your pills. What do you want? You want right. an IUD? Let's put in an IUD. Right. It's never talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so then to switch tracks a little bit, switching over to cancer.gov. So, I mean, this is a government-run website. We, we should have doctors who are talking about this, if nothing else. I can see some people arguing some different studies, although these are very reputable studies. Cancer.gov, this is what they have to say. Overall, these studies that have been provided show consistent evidence that the risk of breast cancer and cervical cancers are increased among women who use oral contraceptives, whereas the risk for endometrial, ovarian, and colorectal cancers are reduced. Mm. And we'll get to that again in a minute. Um, but in an analysis of over 150,000 women across 54 different studies, it showed that overall, women who had ever used oral contraceptives had an increased lifetime risk 7% higher for breast cancer than women who had not ever used yeah. anything. So we yeah. maintain that lifetime risk. Um, women who were currently using oral contraceptives, 24% increased risk for developing breast cancer. Wow. And again, this is from cancer.gov. Right. Uh, that risk, again, it, like I said previously, it does decline after you discontinue use, but there is an overall lifetime risk in general. Separate study from 2017 reports that the risk of breast cancer could have been up to 60% higher than non-users, depending on which preparation they were using, like triphasic pills where you go through three different levels of hormones throughout the month. Those carried a much higher risk than the biphasic or the monophasic pills. Okay. And based on you saying that, if, I feel like there's a lot of different options for even the oh bad gosh. stuff. Like, yes. Like there's, there's a lot of different levels of bad. Yeah, there <laughs> is. And there's a million different birth controls out there. Like for a lot of women, I can tell you, I mean, I was on pills at one point because I didn't know these things. Right. And every month when I would go to pick it up, it was a different one. Oh, really? They changed the brands all the time. They changed the names all the time. The concentrations were changing. It was always something different. Oh, wow. And they tell you that they're all the same, but they're not really all the same. Man, that's I mean, scary. The studies show that the risks are different between different ones. And but they can just up change. To, yeah, but wow. up to a 60% chance for breast cancer. Wow. Yeah. Um, but average risk was around 20%. And again, risk was more with prolonged use. Mm. So then cervical cancer. I mentioned cervical cancer. Yep. Uh, and just backing up for a second, breast cancer is the number two cancer among women. Number one being skin cancer. Okay. One in eight women, statistically right now, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer at some point during their life. Yeah. It, so, it, and it hits everybody. Big. Like, yeah. I, you know, everyone has a, a friend, a relative, a, a mom, a sister yeah. who has, you know, been affected by this. It's, and I mean, what would those rates be if we weren't doing things like this? And what's interesting, and I know I'm naive uh, to this, but... I feel like we're not talking about birth control. We're talking about other things mm -hmm. as far as like, you know, causes and yeah. things like that. I know soy is something that people talk a lot about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't hear no. about birth control. No, this so is never wild. a part that's mentioned in but that. But everyone, you know, has been affected, has been yeah. on birth control at in, in some, some degree. Yeah, yeah. Wild. Um, so moving on into cervical cancer, women who have used oral contraceptives for five or more years, again, this is coming from cancer.gov, have a higher risk of cervical cancer than women who have never used an oral contraceptive. Mm. So 10% increased risk with less than five years of the contraceptive use. Mm. And this study was based on an oral. So this is going to be your combined uh, progestin estrogen. So the, the, the 
length of time on it does play Absolutely. a factor. So okay. 10% with less than five years, 60% increased risk for cervical cancer when you've used it between five and nine years. Wow. Yeah. Man. And that declined after uh, discontinuation of, of use of okay. the birth control. But yeah. Was it, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, people are on medications for, you know, they just uh, assume they're on it forever. Yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming when you talked with an OB way, you know, when you were young, uh, not that you're not, not young now. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Younger. <laughs> Younger. Uh, you didn't have that talk for like, how, no, how long not. should I be on this? Mm-mm. There is just no, no discussion of discontinuation. Stop yeah. it when you want to get pregnant. Start back on one whenever you're done. Yeah. That was That's it. Wow. Yeah. That's wild. Um, so I did mention some positives earlier, so we'll look at those. Okay. I don't know if the positives outweigh the negatives, but there has been through studies, they've shown that there's a decreased risk for endometrial cancer. So women who have used contraceptive, hormonal contraceptive, versus women who have never used it, the women who have used it have about a 30% risk reduction for endometrial cancer. Okay. And they think that this is because we're not building up that endometrium the same way. Um, and so that. There's that, if that helps. Mm. Um, Ovarian cancer, women who have used contraceptives, 30 to 50% lower risk for ovarian cancer versus women who have not. Again, they think because it's inhibiting ovulation, we're not ovulating as many times through our life, we're reducing that risk there. Uh, And then colorectal cancer, 15 to 20% reduced risk for colorectal cancer because it changes the bile acids in Mm. the gut. Again, I don't know personally, those risks and benefits don't really weigh out to me, but that is something that the patients need to be educated on. Right. And, and I think, you know, a big thing here is for the listeners out there is like, it's a balance thing, Absolutely. you know, and I, I you're going to go into some of the, okay, say you do have to be on birth yeah. control what for one reason or another, yeah. uh, you know, what can you do and yeah. uh, what's the safest way to go about it? Absolutely. And that's what a lot of medicine comes down to is yeah. risk versus benefit. The patient can't make that decision unless they've been properly informed. You got to have all the, all the information. Yeah. 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 So can you decide if you want to take that 30% increased risk for breast cancer? cancer because you get a 50% decreased risk for ovarian cancer, like you, you've got to be able to be the one to weigh that out. And mm. you need a provider. We all need to be providers that are educating our patients on this. Yeah. Um, so like you said, share this because yeah. most providers are not educating. Uh, and then, like you said, there are other options. So there are definitely situations where women don't need to get pregnant. Young teenagers, we've got to have some options if they're not super reliable in what they're doing. You know, there are medical conditions that it would literally kill the mother if she became pregnant. So there's absolutely situations where we need to be able to prevent pregnancy. But women need to know what all their options are because you're not presented with those a lot of times. Um, So most people know different barrier methods, diaphragm, condoms, spermicides, things like that. With typical use, meaning the average person that's not going to do it perfectly, failure rate with something like a diaphragm is about 17%. Failure rate with condoms is about 13%. Spermicides about 21%. So not the greatest rates on those um, because most people at some point are either going to forget to use it or they're not going to use it appropriately. There is a Paragard IUD. This is a copper IUD. Um, So it contains absolutely no type of hormones whatsoever. It's approved for 10 years. And so it's implanted into the uterus and it causes an inflammatory process. So I don't love that, but again, it has no hormones and it's 99.2% effective. Mm. So very, very low failure rate. If I had someone that absolutely had to prevent a pregnancy and didn't want like permanent sterilization, Paragard's probably the route that I would recommend. Okay. Is there a, is there any risk associated for length of time staying with that or? With that one, no. Okay. No. Okay. Um, then you, of course, have permanent sterilization, either a vasectomy for the male or a tubal ligation for the female. Um, both of those can come with issues as well. That's a whole other topic. Uh, then you have things like withdrawal method. Obviously, failure rate is going to be pretty high right. with that. That's not super reliable. Um, and then my personal favorite that I like to educate my patients on is going to be natural family planning. Mm. So failure rate's really 
really vary with this because you've got people who are going to be absolutely perfect at it and people who are absolutely not. So it's anywhere from a 2% to a 23% failure rate statistically with this. And I'm assuming, again, I'm super naive, going by the cycle, the woman's cycle. Right. And there's a lot of different things that women can look at. And there's tons of information out there on this. There's tons of devices to help us with this. Uh, Basal body temperature tracking is one of them where you actually take your temperature at the exact same time every morning before you get out of bed. And we watch temperature rises because that's going to lead us to know when ovulation is happening, when our most fertile days are. Um, There's things like the R ring that you can actually do with a specific fertility. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. There's a fertility tracking app that you can do with that and it tracks your temperature for you and it it takes a month or two with temp tracking to be accurate but it's going to track your temperature for you and tell you when your most fertile days are. Got it. So you know to either use a backup method or avoid those days completely. Okay. Uh, Women can track things like cervical mucus. We can do LH tracking, luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone spikes before ovulation so we can track those levels through urine. Uh, And then also if someone has very regular cycles, we can also go by a calendar because, you know, if you have yeah. a, a normal 28 day cycle, you're probably going to be most fertile in about a five day window. That's a yeah. pretty predictable window. So something like that is helpful as well. And a lot of people avoid pregnancy this way for very long periods of time without having unintended pregnancies. So, and this uses absolutely no hormones. This has no effect on menstruation. This is just learning what your body's doing and learning how to not get pregnant through that. You know, I think that's a lot of what you're preaching with functional fertility. Oh, absolutely. It's just like knowing your body better. Yeah. You know, and that's a, that's a huge part of natural family planning, I'm assuming. Yeah. Oh, it is. So There's actually a book I really like. It's called The Fifth Vital Sign, and it's, it's all about your period as being a vital sign for women. It's all oh, about wow. how our period is showing us how healthy or unhealthy we are. Really? Yeah. So that's it's a really cool book. You should check it out. Uh, we will link that uh, below us. So the fifth vital sign. Fifth vital sign. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going, you know, I know this is, uh, we're going to wrap up here soon, but um, so many people watching and listening yeah. have probably been on birth control before. Absolutely. Um, it's, you know, so I'm thinking of people I'm very close to. Uh, how, what should they do now? Like, how do they go about, like, should they go straight on to natural family planning? Is there any sort of detox? You know, like, yeah. what can I do? So oral birth controls, which we talked about previously, deplete a lot of minerals. So coming off of an oral birth control, we're always wanting to get onto a really good multivitamin or even a good prenatal vitamin to replenish a lot of that, that it it depletes, Mm -hmm. Um, specifically things like zinc and copper and uh, B6 and things like that are depleted very easily when you're on oral birth control. So coming off of those, simply stopping it and then start replacing those vitamins that we have depleted. Okay. Uh, You know, the long acting reversible contraceptives, the LARCs are a little bit harder. It's not something you can just stop. You've got to get in with your doctor and have them remove it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the implanon, which is a little implant that goes in the arm that actually has to be cut out and removed or an IUD that they, you know, pull the strings and remove it. So that's takes a little bit more. It's not something you could do today, Uh, but definitely you can have those removed and the body will start to return to a normal pattern pattern of menstruation, typically within a month or two for most people. Okay. Uh, you know, there are other things. If things are not returning the way that they need to, there's different supplements that I like to use for people. I use Vitex for everything. Chase Berry, I love it for balancing hormones. Inositol, uh, looking at diet and things like that. So there's a lot that we can do afterwards to rebalance things if needed. Okay. But the first thing is deciding what you want to do instead. If you're at a phase in your life where you, you just can't afford to be pregnant right now for whatever reason, Um, then figuring out what other methods you're going to use and how you're going to be reliable with that. It's super interesting. And and I, you know, I, uh, I have to ask this question because I know uh, we'll get comments. Uh, Weight gain with birth control. Oh, that's a huge thing with birth control. A lot of people, I've just heard a lot about it. What's, what's kind of happening there? Is that all hormonal? We're throwing synthetic hormones in there and we're throwing off the natural hormones. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that doctors may tell you about sometimes. Right. You can develop headaches. You can have, you know, dizziness. You can have changes in blood pressure. You can have weight gain, decreased libido. Um, There's the risk for like pulmonary embolisms, different clotting, strokes, all those sorts of things. They'll tell you about that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, It's just all your, your cancer risks. It's just not out there. This was an important episode. It was. 
Is that a show? It's a show. Robin, thank you. Absolutely. Guys, thank you all for watching. And if you got anything out of this, is this if this connected with you, share it with somebody you love uh, and tell them to watch it to the end. Robin, thank you. Absolutely. You name it, we explain it. We'll see you next time. Don't go away.